when I learned this, my ah vowel that has been a pain in the butt my entire life, as soon as I started doing this, I was able to sing through my range without a break on an ah. It's just been amazing. Hi, my name is Sam Johnson and I'm a voice teacher. Today I am going to be showing a exercise that was taught to me at the International Voice Teachers of Mix conference a few weeks ago by Ken Bozeman, who is a wonderful teacher and has been kind of a pioneering force in popularizing vocal acoustics. He is the author of a few vo books, Practical Vocal Acoustics and Kinesthetic Vocal acoustics. I can't remember the exact name. There's the blue one and the green one. And if you get them, you should get the blue one first and then get the green one, but they're both fantastic. This exercise is called the chiaroscuro whisper. Chiaroscuro is Italian for light and dark. Chiaro is brightness, light, and oscuro is darkness, depth, warmth. So uh, I'm reading this Leonardo da Vinci book right now, and they were talking about his his amazing use of chiaroscuro in making drapes look realistic. People use this term to talk about a lot of different art. In vo voice world, it's most commonly used in opera land where people don't want too chiaro of a sound. A lot of people kind of prefer a too oscuro sound, but what's best is a sound that has both. So instead of going vaga luna che in argenti, pretty chiaro, Vaga luna che in argenti, pretty oscuro. Vaga luna. Kind of has a little bit more in the middle. The point with this, with the whisper, is that most people kind of whisper really chiaro. Like, hey, hey, everyone, can you be a little bit quiet? Hey, hey, can you be quiet? See, that first one I had a little bit of voice in it. Hey, can you be quiet? But it's still very, very bright. We could also find somewhere that's a little bit more in the middle. It's this kind of place in the middle and we're not. It's a lot more to ourselves. Anyway, that's kind of where we're gonna end up with this. The fun part and the reason that I love this a lot is because we get to tune our vowels to specific pitches, to specific frequencies. It's not very much of a stretch for most people to believe that pitches have frequencies. And um, within a pitch, oh, that's a weird sound. So with this one, this is a C3. So it has a hertz of somewhere around 125. Um, and then at, there's an overtone series that is multiple frequencies that gives us the actual tone of a sound. So if this is 125, this is 250-ish, this is 500, and it just keeps going up by doubling the original um, number. So uh, I will show you what that looks like in Voce Vista. Okay, so I'm gonna switch this to Lin instead of Log and Play. So that's playing that one note um, as it continues and the, the piano fades away, the amplitude starts lowering. But this is the first the first frequency, the fundamental frequency, and then all of these are overtones. And because of how these are shaped with varying levels of amplitude, we get a sound that sounds like a piano. So that's what uh, resonance, nah, that's what the overtone series kind of looks like. Not that hard to believe, right? Vowels also have frequency. And we understand certain vowels as certain vowels if certain frequencies are present. I'm kind of dumbing this down in certain ways and I'm also not dumbing it down in other ways because maybe I'm just dumb and I just don't know everything about speech science and I'm okay with that. I've come to terms with that, but I'm gonna explain it as best as I understand this. And um, if people, if real scientists have any issues with that, that's fine, that's fine and great. Um, please leave comments below about your issues with this. Okay, so we're going to tune these vowels using a whisper. The whisper is basically white noise. And once the white noise passes through your vocal tract, how your vocal tract is shaped will filter out certain frequencies so that we're left with just certain other frequencies. And whichever frequencies are left are the frequencies that we are going to be tuning to specific frequencies by moving around our mouth. 
mostly by moving around the back of our tongue. So uh, I will show you in Voce Vista what that looks like. So in this, you see this bottom frequency. This is called the first formant. The first formant is, so a formant is a peak on a spectrograph, I think. Um, resonances are the spaces that have values. So in our vocal tract, we have many resonances. We can tune on purpose two of them. The first resonance, which is this one, this bottom peak in the image, and the second resonance, which is this top peak. And the way that we control it is by just saying different vowels. If we say an ah or an uh, these two resonances are quite close together. As we moved up toward this one, this is more of an E, and they are very, very far apart. What we're going to be doing with this whisper is tuning this specifically. So right now, my uh, Voce Vista is set up so that the frequencies are accurate to what they actually are. Um, they, they're they not like moving around. Here's the other way. If I click log up here, then suddenly it becomes more even with the, the piano, but the distance between these is no longer accurate. Okay, so I wanna play with line L-I-N for right now because that makes a little bit more sense for what we're doing, but I'll probably go back and forth. Okay, so we're going to tune these to specific frequencies. Why does this help? How is this useful? I like thinking about it as if we're tuning a guitar. If we're tuning a guitar, um, I'll show you. A lot of times we will start, so we tune this guitar by moving the pegs up at the top. And what that does is it increases and decreases the amount of tension on the string. So uh, if a lot of times people will tune a guitar by starting with a lowered pitch, so it's like really low, and then we want to find our reference pitch, which is up here. And then we tighten it until the pitch of the guitar matches what our reference pitch is, and that's how we know that it is in tune. What we're doing with this is we are also kind of going to slide up from the bottom of our range up until we match a reference pitch that I will give on a piano. So what we're doing with this is we are trying to find more helpful vowel shapes, tune to them before we go sing, so that just like with a guitar, we wanna tune our vowels and then keep tuning them as we come back. The, the biggest difference with this and a guitar is that we have a brain. And so as you tune your vowels to these specific frequencies more frequently, you will probably get to them faster and faster and faster, where, you know, if a guitar had a brain, maybe it would remember the exact tension level that makes it sound like that, and it would go out of tune less frequently. Okay, so with this, we're going to be playing with a sequence of notes, which is B6, A6, G6, E6, sometimes D6, uh, B5, A5, and G5. So I like going with the E, and I'll tell you the difference about them later, but I'm going to play with the E for now. B, A, G, E, B, A, G. Let's look at that in Voce Vista. Good. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting about this is as the pitch gets lower, because it has a lower fundamental frequency, that number is just smaller, you will see more of these resonances, or more of these um, overtones as you start going up. So with this, this low one, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six on screen. This first one, you just see two of them because it's already starting at such a high pitch that as you go up to the next pitch, or the next doubling of that fundamental frequency number, it's just way higher. There's a bigger difference in between, which also explains why uh, for higher notes, we need much more precise vowels than we do with lower notes, because as we get more to speech, it just like doesn't need to be as precise to make things work. So this is the sequence that we're working with. And now I'm going to whisper and try to match that same thing. The whisper, we're going to be matching the pitch of my whisper, my second formant, to these pitches. 
So this is what that looks like. Good, so this first one, this was my reference pitch of the B6, and then my there was an amplitude increase um, at around that frequency. The distance between these is called the bandwidth. So um, the bandwidth of the piano is pretty minimal compared to the bandwidth of my whisper, um, but kind of the average of it still matches up with that. Then as I went between these other pitches, it sort of went down in the same sort of sequence as this. Now I'm going to play and then whisper on each of them so you can see it more precisely. Cool. So you see after each of those, the second frequency matches the, uh, or the second resonance matches the frequency of the pitch that I'm playing on the piano. Okay. Now for you to start doing this, I want you to pretend that your guitar start with a lowered frequency and then slide up until you match the reference pitch. Let's start that in Voce Vista. See, that second one went a little bit higher. This first one also went a little bit too high compared to this one. The second one went way higher. And the way that I'm increasing the pitch of that is by moving the back of my tongue. So start by doing a pitch sweep like this from a lowered uh up to a very high E and then back down and try to make it as smooth as you can. So we're not just going uh, E, we're going uh, I'll show that on Voce Vista. And as the tongue increases, as the tongue rises, it increases the pitch. Okay, now we're going to do it and try to get more close to the specific pitch, which is a B. And this is the thing that's just really nutso to me, is that if you tune it to these specific pitches, it's the same for every voice type. So far, right? Um, Ken has said that this has not really been tested on a wide enough sample. Um, this is all kind of new, and these are pitches that he's kind of come up with, but in my experience, since I've been playing with this and teaching it to my students, yes, these pitches work for pretty much everyone, and after people tune to these pitches, tune their vowels to these pitches, they very commonly will say that singing feels easier if they sing through these pitches. So here's tuning to the B6 which is going to sound kind of like an E vowel. So my tendency is to get a little closer to E. If we tune it to the B, it might actually sound a little closer to an E, but it's, it's still when you actually start singing, it's going to sound more like an E. And there's this other band up here that's fairly strong. Um, I think that's the Singer's Formant cluster. So because it is also present, and even though this is kind of a little bit lower than what we'd actually hear as an E, all of this together will start sounding like an E. And I think that tuning it to this makes E just feel a little bit less tight. So if you slide up and you tune it to a C instead, still kind of overshot it, but um, you get the point. That feels a lot more tight. And it just feels tight. I don't like what it feels like. And that's without even making any sound, any, any phonation without voicing it. All the sound is just from the whisper, and just because of how my mouth is positioned, it just feels tighter. So try playing a B and sliding up until you hear it kind of match that. It's useful using Voce Vista or using another Spectrograph software because you can see precisely if it is matching that, and I do think that there are quite a few free options available. Voce Vista is great. It's um, kind of the gold standard, and it's very fully featured. 
I do not take advantage of it as much as I think some people do, but it's very, very good. But even without having this, you can kind of just hear if it's if it's high or not. This is the B. And then you just stop when it sounds right. If I overshoot it, there's this dissonance. Good. Once you get used to that, then we want to tune to the A, which will voice kind of like an A vowel, which is a closed E um, in IPA. Uh, it sounds kind of like chaos, the vowel in chaos. So here's the A. Uh, I'll record it. Yeah, pretty close. And if I vocalize through that, hey, hey, that feels really, really nice. Now going to the G, which will sound kind of like an E eh in feather. Pretty close. Eh, eh. Um, also, you might notice the pitches that we are tuning these vowels to have nothing to do with the pitch that you're going to sing it on. So that's one of the weirdest things that like you kind of have to get your mind around it. But once you get your mind around it, it starts making a lot of sense and it becomes very, very quick to use this. Now, after you get the eh, the next one is the ah. This ah is kind of bright. I teach mostly musical theater and pop and rock and contemporary vocal styles. I like that brightness. Some of that is just aesthetic. I know Ken prefers tuning to the D. He teaches mostly classical. I think it's nice to have both available because it just gives you a different sound. So if I'm tuning to the E, it sounds like this. Ah. Ah, it's a pretty bright sound. It's kind of like the Boston pock the ka ah 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 sound. Um, if I was tuning it to the D, it would look like this. Ah, ah, slightly darker, a little bit more appropriate for certain styles of music. It can become very trial and error-ish, like if one of these, if you tune your vowel to one of these pitches and it just still doesn't feel right or sound right, try the other one, see if it feels right and sounds right. Because this is a tool. This is not just like, you have to be specifically on these pitches or else you sound bad. This is, I have found a very good exploratory tool to start feeling what different vowels can be and how to adjust vowels at a very granular level where it's objective. It's saying, this is the exact goal, let's go to it, and then we can test it. Because I think that the more objective that we get when we're working with voices, the more we can turn it into an actual experiment and test if it's good or not by repeating it. A lot of times in voice, we're just using words like make that a little bit warmer or a little bit darker. Necessary, important. I've taught for a long time haven't used this tool, gotten some really good results. Most people have not used this tool. Most voice teachers get really good results. This is just, I think, awesome because it is so specific and because once someone knows how to use this, they can do those tests on themselves and have this visual representation of like, am I getting it or am I not? Am I sharp or am I flat? You don't have to know more than that. And as long as you can adjust the pitch of the whisper, by moving the back of your tongue up and down, if you recognize that it's sharp or it's flat, you can find it and pinpoint the exact frequency without help of another person. To me, that is huge. With all of these, the high note, like the B, there is a lot further distance that you need to go before it tunes to it. When you get down to the D and the E, you don't have to move very much. It's probably pretty close to it already. So that I think can be a little bit more difficult. That's why I highly suggest starting with the, the high B, A, and G, because if you can nail those really precisely, you probably have enough skills to start working on this one. The lower ones, 
B, A, and G an octave lower are um, O, so open O, O, and U. I'll show you what those ones look like. Cool, so it just goes down a little bit. And with these ones, instead of moving the back of the tongue to achieve the different pitches, you just have to round the lips more and more progressively. If you don't round the lips enough, it might look like this. So with that last one, I went, I just changed how much I was rounding my lips. My larynx also rose slightly. So you can see, <laughs> slightly, um, it went up quite a bit. So that's how we tune these. Once you're able to do this by tuning, by sliding up like we're tuning a guitar, then you can just do the whole pit or the whole sequence. That's after playing the whole thing. But as you get even better at this, you just need the B. And the rest of it is just a melody. So it's um, B. Three blind mice, law, three blind mice. Ah. And if you get that pitch sequence in your head, then you just need the B. And the rest of it, you can just kind of figure out. Okay, that's it. Like once you learn how to do this, that's the tuning. That's tuning your guitar before you go play. That's tuning your vowels before you go sing. And the more you come back to this, it will likely hold on to some quality of that when you actually go to sing. And I have noticed that with a lot of my students that even if we don't do anything other than that, going to sing is a slightly different experience. It feels like magic. Like I I know that no, no tool is everything, but this is... This is a really, really useful tool. I, I have been in love with this tool. Um, other use cases is you can use these whispers to set up other exercises. I like using it for vocal slides like this. Ah, ah, and just doing some slides starting with the vowel that I want. Notice the ah that I tuned to is right about here. So if I turn this back to log, um, right here, uh, what was it? E, E6. Yep, right there, about E6. This is not an E6, the pitch that I'm singing it on. I just start kind of at the bottom of my range. I like starting in a chestier place and then doing a slide up. Um, notice also with that, I'm trying not to go ah and chase the quality up. Let's see what that would look like. Ah versus ah. I'm not good enough at Voce Vista to notice the difference between those, honestly, to notice why one looks like the other. Um, some people, uh, maybe if I turn down this intensity, this dynamic range, we would be able to see some more differences or the brightness. I don't know. That's something that I'd like to keep learning more about is how to actually use this kind of stuff. But anyway, we don't want to let it try to sound like that ah uh, all the way through. If we're going to make it kind of mixy, we need to let the vowel sound migrate as we move through our range. This is another tool that Kenneth um, taught at that conference. But if you use kind of a sad toddlery sound, uh, uh, and let that quality come in as you're doing the slide up, ah, it changes that quality versus ah, where you just cap out. There's you just can't go as high. So use this tool, use the whisper, tune your vowel, tune the mouth shape so that it's the optimal mouth shape for that vowel. 
and then do some slides. And you can do that with every single one of these. So doing it to the eh. Eh. Doing it to the A. Eh. Doing it to the E. E. All pretty easy. When I learned this, my ah vowel that has been a pain in the butt my entire life, especially since I started doing voice lessons and caring about this more, ah has not made very much improvement. As soon as I started doing this, I was able to sing through my range without a break on an ah. It's just been amazing. Here's why. My default ah tunes to a C. Ah, ah, you hear how dark that is? Um, that's kind of like a, a Swedish yaw, ah. If you're singing like that, it just doesn't work as well. Most of the time. Some people can get away with it and that's where you gotta just experiment on this on your own. As soon as you do this, this higher one, what happens is the tongue, the back of the tongue raises high enough that it's no longer occupying all the space in the throat and then things work better. Most teachers agree that we want to sing with a very open throat. That is a very counterintuitive thing because most of the time when people are told to sing open-throated, they will, they will put him in this kind of yawny place and a lot of people, it feels like the sound's back here, but uh, how could the sound be back here? Because like, your throat's here, you know, it's much more forward. What happens with this is the base of the tongue often will retract and start pushing the larynx down um, but all of that space in your throat, in your pharynx, gets occupied by the tongue pushing back. E is going to be more likely the most open-throated vowel because to get that E, like we've demonstrated, the back of the tongue needs to raise until it matches closer to the B or even the C, which just gets your tongue so much forward, more forward that none of that size, none of that mass of the tongue is occupying your throat. It's great. Two other things. Once you find these vowel shapes, you still need to open your mouth more for high notes. So you can tune your vowel, tune your second formant in this way, and then start opening your mouth while trying to maintain that pitch. Notice that is remaining mostly the same. If I let it drop as I open my mouth, it would look like this. That's what it looks like if the tongue doesn't maintain that tuning. If it doesn't continue tuning the second resonance to about that pitch, creating this second formant at around 2000 hertz. That's what it looks like with that. For an ah, it would look more like this. I'm again tuning this to the E. Ah! As I open and close my mouth there, the second formant was remaining about the same. If it lowered, it would look like this. So that's what to kind of watch out for and see if you can open and close your mouth on each of these vowels that you tune without the pitch changing of the second formant. That's one part of it. The second part is we can kind of play with this back room while maintaining that second formant tuning. Um, a lot of people like using that yawn analogy for feeling a nice open back throat, but when we yawn, the back of the tongue will kind of pull back a lot of times. I think that using this makes the yawn work a lot better because you can see if using the yawn is pulling that down or not, like this. Versus if it pulls it down. So this first one, I kept it mostly the same. The second one, this pitch dropped as soon as I started yawning because my tongue retracted. So now we can use this 
to actually use the yawn to find an open space, to raise the soft palate and lower the larynx, create a really tall room in the back without compromising the second formant. It's been magic. I hope that you find this kind of magic as well. Okay, so use cases, just tune it like a guitar and then go sing. Second use case, find a good vowel shape and then sing an exercise through it. I suggest using slides because you don't need to know a whole thing after it. You just tune it, find what that feeling feels like and then do a slide. Three, use it in specific songs. So if you're having trouble with one word in one song, maybe find what that vowel is that you're singing it on. For example, if you're trying to sing um, Falcon in the Dive, that's a high note of a G. Um, that's an A ah vowel. If you were tuning your A ah to this C, ah, 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 it works, but it's really heavy. If I tune it to this E, It just feels so much better. It feels so much better. And it's something that you can test over and over and over again because you're tuning it to specific frequencies rather than just going by feel or going by sound, which are also really important qualities with this. But I think that the more that we can objectify singing, the more that we can objectify this stuff, it's just better. It's better, it gives us good starting goals so that we can then run experiments with any sort of consistency. If variables are changing every time that we run an experiment, how are you gonna deduce what's actually making a difference? Like it's it becomes so much harder. So to tune for specific words in songs, you find the appropriate vowel. Look at the chart. I will put a chart, a link to the chart that Kenneth Bozeman has created in the description. Look at the chart, see what matches the IPA. Play the pitch, match the pitch. Then play the actual note that you're singing it on. I'll, I'll use this one um, as an example because it's gonna be the same. So I'll use A and A. So I'll, I'll tune it to an A6 and then sing on an A4. Hey, 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 and that will likely work pretty well. Or if it doesn't work, it at least gives you a really good starting place that you can then just make little adjustments with. Again, that's one of the weirdest things is this idea that the pitches that we're tuning these vowels to has nothing to do with the pitches that we're going to end up actually singing it on. Once you get through that idea and just start thinking of, okay, the pitch that I'm tuning it to is just so that I can find the optimal vocal tract shape. And then I play a different pitch, tune that in my head without moving that vocal tract shape, sing through it. That's the process. Tune high notes, tune any notes that are kind of hard in a song, tune first notes of phrases. If you just start with that, you're at least starting from a good place or you know where you're going that is going to be a good place. So that's the Chiaroscuro Whisper. If you stuck around to watch all of this, props to you. You are probably pretty nerdy. Um, you don't have to be very nerdy to understand this. Once you learn how to tune this, it is just an exercise. You don't need to consciously understand why it works. You just need to be able to know if the pitch that you're whispering is matching a reference pitch. If you can start hearing that difference, you can start using this tool. If you can't hear the vowel as pitches, you can still match the quality of someone else's whisper. So look through this, see if you can, if you're not hearing it as pitch, at least try to match the quality of the whisper that I'm doing and see if you can hear how that is changing because that's going to get you at least pretty close and maybe with repetition you'll start hearing it with pitch and be able to match it a little bit more accurately. If you can't hear this, you're not broken. This is weird. It is a new way of thinking about sound for most people. I hope you like it. I hope you play around with it and really enjoy it. So in the description, there's the link to the um, PDF, which we'll put on screen for just a second here so that you know what it looks like. And there is a link to Kenneth talking about this exercise as well. All credit to him for coming up with all of this stuff. Through teaching this, I've kind of come up with my own spin on everything. And I uh, talk a lot more about specific things with it. And I hope that that's useful for you. And I hope that this 
changes your life as much as it's changed mine in the last few weeks. Because really, that ah vowel has been so hard for me. Oh, here's the one other thing I was going to say. Ah, once you, if you tune it to a C and then you slowly move it up to the E like this. Uh, let's go here. Once you know what that looks like and what that feels like, or looks like on this and sounds like, you can also just pay attention to what your body feels like. I notice as soon as I get it up to about the D or the E, I no longer feel anything right here. Even if I'm not vocalizing, if I'm not making whisper, if I'm just moving my mouth into the position that I would use for a default ah that tunes to a C, I feel a lot of something back here. I think that's my tongue taking up a lot of space in my throat. As soon as I start moving it up, even if I don't change, if I don't vocalize it, there is a moment that I suddenly don't feel it in my throat. And look at my tongue in this. Like, you can also do this in front of a mirror. Uh, if you can't see your tongue, you're probably a little too far back. And there's just this sudden moment that it just feels like less. And most of the time, really good singing doesn't feel like much. So, even if you're not hearing these specific pitches, if you have boundaries, if you say, uh, is like really, really far back, ah, uh, is like really far forward, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, without trying to change my first formant as much, that was a mistake, ah, 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 then just choose somewhere in the middle, ah, uh, ah, uh, that's likely gonna be a pretty good place. Works with all these vowels. And that's where we get that chiaroscuro element of it, even doing it on a whisper. Suddenly everything is right here rather than if everything is a lot more forward. So as you're doing this, um, Kenneth also recommends using affect, like skepticism, like, uh, I'm not sure, it's, everything's just a little bit more here, rather than like, I'm being really aggressive. But I found that the more that people tune to these specific pitches, that kind of takes care of itself. So they're all just tools. Play around with them. Please leave some comments below and also go check out Kenneth's video. Give him a bunch of views and leave comments there. Thank you for watching. Have a good one.